Join me every month for the inspiration to find your finish line. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Find Your Finish Line, presented by Curad Performance, the official medical supplier of Iron Man. I'm Mike Riley, and this podcast is not only about you being able to find your finish line at a race or an event, but also in life. I'll talk to people from all walks of life who have had to overcome and jump a lot of hurdles to get to the finish line. And the one I have on today as the guest, I recorded her back in September before the Ironman World Championship, but uh, you'll know why we didn't put that podcast up. But she has found a ton of finish lines throughout her life. Hello, Lindsay Corbin from Bend, Oregon. Hi, thanks for having me back. I I'm, I'm flattered I get a redo, and thank you for letting us redo it. <laughs> well, Lindsay, I, you know, uh, you and I go way, way back, and it's an honor to be able to talk to you again when we weren't able to put the podcast up because you had an injury before Kona, and we'll get into all that. I was really, I was really heart sick. I, I, like everybody else, learned about your injury, you know, a little bit after it happened, and I, I wanted to send you a message and a note, and I may have, but I just felt that so many people were going to do that. But it really hit me hard, and I think it hit a lot of other people hard, Lindsay. I hope you realize that because of the type of career you had. Were you surprised at the reaction you received? Yeah, definitely. I mean, no one was let down more than anything than myself. I was let down more than like any note or anything, you know, and it really came out of left field as most injuries do. Like when we spoke in September, all systems were go. And, you know, I thought that final finish line was in sight for me. And then um, I went one day of being great and the next day of like, oh, crap, this is not good. Something's wrong. And um, yeah, I ended up having a stress fracture in the um, femur, which is pretty serious mm. stress fracture. And um, yeah, my finish line happened then. <laughs> so um, but yeah, I mean, I received so much outpouring of support from people. And it really took me a while to be able to come to the public and be able to say it, which is why I think I, I knew I wasn't going to be able to complete the race, you know, for about a week or two. And then I finally was like, you're gonna, the news is going to come out, you're going to have to let it go. But so much goes into preparing for the world championships. And it was like, training camps were booked, hotels were booked, travel was booked, custom kits were made, you know, custom bikes were done, like everything was dialed in. And so wow. it just felt like I was not only letting myself down, but letting everyone else down. And it was, um, it was a big mental, probably more so a mental hurdle than a physical hurdle for me to get over. So, yeah. Well, I know you probably had some conversations with Chris, with your husband, with family, uh, before you made that decision to let people know. Mm -hmm. Did you also call your, you know, sponsors? My goodness, Saucony and Cliff Bar, you've been together with them since the very beginning. How did how did they react? You know, honestly, I called one sponsor and that was the first sponsor I called and I was crying the entire time. Like I could not <laughs> even have a conversation and I thought Oh, no, like if I have to do this eight times to eight different partners, like this is going to just be terrible. So I ended up just writing a really heartfelt email and emailing them and, and letting them know because at the time it was so, I told my sponsors pretty much right away when I knew I wasn't going to be able to race, but mm. it was so raw for me then and just so disappointing. And I mean, it's crazy that like now you have perspective and you look back and I can talk about it no problem, but I mean, you're literally grieving a dream, you know? And so, um, yeah, I tried to tell my sponsors in person in the first go at it. <laughs> I was an emotional mess. But, you know, Chris, as he says, like, you're a mess because you care. Like, and you're crying because you care. And these people are invested in you. And, and it literally is when you've been working with these companies so long, your friends, your team, your family, um, and you know that they're putting just as much into it as you are, which is why I think it was so difficult. Lindsay, you've had a 17-year amazing career, so many accolades, top 10 in Kona multiple times. You've raced there more than any male or female pro as, as a professional. Mm -hmm. 
you were going for your 16th. And when we talked in September, there was one thing you were looking forward to of going to Kona, of not being so serious. She talked to Didi Griesbauer. She gave you some great advice. So you, we had the conversation, Mike, I'm going to enjoy it. I'm going to go see people. I'm going to talk to people. I'm going to go see things, go out and have dinner and all that good stuff. And when all of a sudden life like that throws you a curveball, how did you, how'd you get through it truthfully? Did you just wait for time to heal or did you have more conversations with one you love? How'd you actually get through that? Yeah, you know, I think initially it was really tough. The first few days when I found out were just, like I said, you're almost grieving a dream. And especially I've been injured before. When you've been racing 17 years, you have setbacks, you have mm-hmm. races that are DNFs or, D- you know, races that you can't start. But this one was difficult because it was like, all right, this was supposed to be the final race. And um, yeah, those first few days were just raw emotions. And then honestly, you take the lessons that you learn from Ironman. And that's that like you you have to keep moving forward. And luckily, I have had other setbacks before in my career. And I knew like, I can bounce back from this, like I can get to Um, the next day. And I know, like you said, time heals all wounds. Things are going to keep getting better and better. And I do think that once I came out with it publicly that I wasn't going to be able to race and people were really supportive. And you just realized like we are part of a community and people care about you much more than like a race result. And the race result isn't going to define you. And um, I do think I relied a lot on Chris, my husband, a lot during that time. And he just reminded me that like, one more finish in Kona isn't going to define or make who you are. You're still Lindsay Corbin. You still have these core values at the root of it all. And um, I do think it is important to like share your journey with other people and to be vulnerable. And I think a lot of the time as professional athletes, like we get put on this pedestal that, you know, we, we don't get injured. We don't go through hard times. And, and the honest reality is like, the Ironman wins are amazing, but I think where you grow and you learn are in these difficult times. And so I guess I kind of just embraced it of like, this is another growing opportunity and a chance to learn more about yourself and um, really, you know, it defines who your character is. So I guess I leaned into those things and took it one day at a time, to be honest. Well, Lindsay, the reason I really wanted to start this podcast was just because of the last two minutes of of what you just said. (laughs) To have that attitude and to stay positive through the tough times, because as we know, triathlon seems to mirror life. There's ups and downs. You have this great plan. You get knocked down and you go, what happened there? I I wasn't planning on that. But you get back up. Your attitude is one that I think everybody needs to, to, to bring home and to constantly pull out of themselves every day. Lindsay, did did you have any inkling of wanting to go to Kona and watch? Yeah. I just thought about that. I just, I go, oh my God, you didn't come and watch. Yeah. You know, right away, everyone's like, you're still going to go. You're still going to go and watch, aren't you? And I had thought about it, but honestly, the cost and expense of Kona has gotten so expensive and the amount of time and money that we'd put into booking everything. And and I actually have not had COVID yet. And so I had insurance booked on everything. Like ever since COVID, it's like, let's just double insure everything in case something happens. And so I had insurance on everything. And my sister actually was meant to come to watch Kona. She's never seen me race in all 15 times that I've been there. <laughs> and she's got a family. She owns a wine bar. So it's a big deal for her to like get time off of work. And, you know, in the midst of just being in a state of depression, I was like, I don't even know if I want to go. Do you still want to go? Like you have this time off work. And we were joking. And she was like, I think we should go to Paris. <laughs> And I was like, are you serious? And she was like, I think we should like go and just like do a soul searching trip and just go have some fun. And um, so literally we switched our plane tickets from uh, Redmond, Oregon, where I, you know, Bend, Oregon to Kona, Hawaii. And we switched them directly to Paris to Charles de Gaulle. And (laughs) so I, I don't know if it's like good news or bad news. It was an ex like a lifetime experience to go spend a week in Paris with my sister, but I literally traded I traded in Ironman Hawaii for a trip to Paris. So 
<laughs> well, you know, the old adage, when one door closes, another fantastic door opens up. You got to spend the time with your sister in Paris. Good for you. I'm glad you I'm glad you did that. Yeah. Good and for I, you. I like I said, I think it would have been pretty tough for me to watch. And I've yeah. I have been injured only one other year, which is the only time I missed Kona. And I went and I actually volunteered that year. So I did body marking. I did bike check in. Um, I got to see the race from the pier. I did finish line catching. And it was a great experience, but it was really tough. And I told um, my husband, Chris, like, I love this race, but I am a competitor and I want to be here racing. And I don't know if I could come back not as an athlete. And so yeah. I guess I kind of took the lessons from that. But now that I'm on the other side, I'm like, I'm definitely going to go back and watch it and like say hi to friends and like have that enjoyable experience that I always wanted. But for this year, it just wasn't meant to be. I could just see you. You're going to be the number one fan out there. You'll be screaming at everybody, yelling, trying to, uh, you know, volunteer at aid stations. I can just see that <laughs> happening. So easy. Yeah. <laughs> hey, how did you, how were you able to keep longtime sponsors your, your entire career? I think Saucony and Cliff are two that, that you've been with forever. How'd you do that? That just doesn't happen in this sport. Was it because... People, uh, how'd you do it? Yeah, I think it was a little bit of luck. I mean, honestly, in 2006, it happened very quickly. I went to do my first Ironman, which was Ironman Coeur d'Alene, and I was signed up to do it as an age grouper. And two weeks before the race, my friends were joking with me that if I signed up to race it as a professional, that I could get a head start in the swim. And I don't come from a swimming background. So I was like, I emailed Heather Fear and USAT and I got my pro license. And two weeks later, I was on the start line for my first Ironman and my first pro race ever. And I also happened to qualify for Ironman Hawaii that year. And then all of a sudden it was like, you need sponsors and, and everything that kind of comes with that. And when I was thinking about who I wanted to work with for sponsors, I basically was like, what's in my closet currently? Like what products am I currently using? <laughs> and I grew up in the outdoors in Bend, Oregon, mountain biking, hiking, camping, and I lived off of cliff bars. So that was pretty easy. It was like, all right, let's just go to cliff bar and see what they think. And um, same with Saucony. Like Saucony was the first running shoe that I'd put on at a specialty run store and I was already running in it. So that was a pretty easy leeway into it of like, I'm this new pro, I run in your shoes. What do you think? And um, both those brands were on board. And like I said, I think it was a little bit of luck and they offered me just free product to start. Like it wasn't these big contracts or anything. And we just formed these relationships. They were smaller companies that were really focused on the athletes. Um, they had really good relationships with the marketing directors and the athletes working together. There was no like agent or middleman. And I think we mm -hmm. honestly just formed relationships that grew together throughout my career. So it definitely started out small. I didn't go for like big contracts out the, you know, the minute I turned pro or anything like that. It was like free shoes. And I thought like, I'm a pro athlete, I'm getting free shoes. And then um, the next year, you know, I got a formal contract. And then the next year after that, I was fifth in Kona. And then I got a, you know, a multi-year contract. And um, honestly, they brands just kind of grew with me throughout my career and I don't know, I always have sort of had a passion in marketing. My husband, Chris, works in marketing. So I think that um, we were sort of at the forefront of digital marketing and marketing yourself and, and what can you give these brands in return. So I think that created a good symbiosis of them all. And um, yeah, I just feel super fortunate that they were able to like stick with it, you know, and stick with me for the entire part of my career. And other brands came and gave me offers and maybe offered me more money. But to me, it was important to have that loyalty to the companies and stick with them. And so, so I did. Well, I've got to give you a prop right now because two and a half years of doing this podcast, I've never had a guest use the word symbiosis. Oh. Nice. You, you are the first. I love it. Uh, when, when I play Scrabble with my wife, I'm going to have to make sure I keep yeah, that yeah. one. Keep that one in the back pocket. That'd be a <laughs> that'd be a good one. Could you, and you know how things turn when you had to make the decision of not going to Kona. Did you ever think that Iron Man Des Moines was going to be our last professional Iron Man? No, I mean, 
I have known for a while that I would be nearing the end of my career. And um, my husband, Chris, has never been my triathlon coach. He's never been my sports psychologist, but he kind of has been those things too. And um, Chris always brought a very level head to um, the way that I was able to view sport. And Chris is not a triathlete. He's done one sprint Mm -hmm. triathlon, one and done. (laughs) But I think that the reason that I was successful, a lot of that is for Chris. And, you know, he was telling me that you have to appreciate everything because you don't know, like, when it will be your last one. And I actually really started to listen to that advice and take it to heart probably around 2018. And in my head, I was thinking that 2020, which was the COVID year, was going to be my last year of racing. And so I actually, even just the other day, Chris and I were driving and we were talking about 2019 Ironman Wisconsin, which I won. And that was the last Ironman I won. And I had no idea at the time, like, this will be the last Ironman you win. But I remember running down State Street and running towards that finish line and hearing you there and just being like, soak up every moment of this because you don't know if this one will be your last or not. And um, I think it was similar in Des Moines. Like, I definitely had no clue in Des Moines, like, this will be your last Ironman finish. And, and that was a that was a very tough race for me. I went to the well. Um, but I think overall, the last few years from 2019 through COVID and everything was just this mentality of appreciate it, enjoy it, and realize that this could be your last opportunity. And um, it's kind of a morbid way to think, I guess. Um, You know, it's a bit stoicism of like, you never know if this will be your last. And um, so, yeah, I don't, um, it is, it is a bitter, it's a very bittersweet ending for sure. Like I'm not gonna sugarcoat that it wasn't a bittersweet ending for me, but I would say most athletes don't end their career how they like in the dream way that they wanted. Of course, I had scripted my head like another top 10 in Kona, another Ironman win. And and none mm-hmm. of those things happen. Mm-hmm. But um, a lot of other great things happened in between. And so I just have to focus on that. And yeah, don't take any finish line for granted. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It's interesting. One of the next questions I had or I was going to make a comment about was, A highlight for me with Lindsey Corbin, besides you and Meredith Kessler finishing a race and giving me a a kiss on the cheek, which I put in my book. (laughs) That's the best picture ever. Well, highlight for me was 2019 when you did win Wisconsin. You went like 913. And it wasn't because, I think it was because you won. You hadn't won one in a while. And you just had a fantastic race. And when you have races like that, all of us that are spectators watching it, I was enamored by it. I, I It was a highlight for me, and I just want to let you know that. Thank you. Yeah. You said... Super memorable. You, you, <laughs> it was. You've said, and I've seen you and, and heard you talk about it, that racing for you was like therapy, especially on the bad days. Can you explain why? Yeah. I mean, I think the bad days are the days where you learn the most about yourself. I mean, the good days, you learn a lot about yourself too, but winning an Ironman, I don't even want to say that it was easy because it's, you know, going sub nine hours or nine hours. Like I would never say like that's easy or a walk in the park, but I look back at some of my toughest races probably were in this last year of my career. I finished um, the Ironman World Champs in St. George, and I was dead last, the last pro yeah. finisher in the field, the the worst finish of my entire career. I was absolutely shocked, and I just knew, like, you have to stay out here, and you have to finish this race, and again, I think it's just a matter of, like, taking a negative and turning it into a positive, and I was having a pity party out on the course and it's like, you're nowhere in the mix. You aren't in the race and this is deep into the marathon. And it's like, let's cheer on some age groupers. You know, like I would say most age groupers are suffering Mm. during that marathon and they're questioning, what am I doing out here? And I think that that's what I will take away most from Ironman is that it um, really is a true test of your character. And it really shows you like what you're built of. And I think the only way to experience those feelings is to be either in a hardship, like dealing with an injury or dealing with a rough patch or anyone with 10 K to go in a marathon. It's tough. You know, like you're digging to the depths of your soul 
And that really is where you get the opportunity to see where you're made of. So I actually almost would get excited during the tough parts of racing because it's like, here's a chance to prove to yourself like who you are. And uh, a mantra that I had a lot towards the end of my career was lead by example. I mean, I was getting pretty tired towards the end of my career and I could tell like I was near the end. And so when I would need motivation and training or if I was with a group, you know, in a group training environment or on the race course, I'd always say to myself, lead by example, lead by example. Because whether you're at the front of the race, the middle of the race, the back of the race, you're retired or not, you're always an example for someone else to look up to. And um, I guess you have a choice. So you have a choice to like have a pity party or, or, you know, try to find the positive in it. Or, you know, you could drop out of a race or just keep putting one foot forward. And so for me, I always kept resonating back these last few years to that mantra of just like lead by example, give your best effort, lead by example, give your best effort, because those are the values and the things that I hope to be remembered by. When you came in St. George as the last professional it absolutely didn't surprise me, but there was a, somebody, a spotter up in the tower with me, and I heard him say, why'd she finish? Why'd she do that? And I just said, because it's Lindsay, <laughs> and that's all it needed to be said. But what I didn't know is that you switched it around to try to cheer on age groupers out there. <laughs> that is admirable. And I'm glad you did that because now I understand when you say it's therapy, you just turn it and turn it into a positive for somebody else and lead by example. Good for you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. You know, you do. I think it was Chris that said you have a Ph.D. in triathlon. You know, you do <laughs> <laughs> trial by fire, going to class every day out on those runs in the pool, the whole deal. You, do you see coaching in your career coming up? not 100% sure. I've obviously gotten a lot of questions and requests. And even I mean, I'm not that farly removed from being retired. And I've already gotten a few job (laughs) offers in the industry, which is extremely flattering. But um, I almost see coaching as like an easy way out. I mean, I think it's a natural thing, like a, a natural progression of like you're a pro triathlete, and then all of a sudden you become a coach. And I have this, I guess it's this weird pull, like I have this whole wealth of knowledge and I love encouraging other people. I think I'm a great people person and communicator. So all great skill sets that I think would make a wonderful coach. And the reason why I didn't coach while I was racing was that I have this all or nothing personality. So a lot of people would be like, oh, are you going to coach on the side? And I thought, you know, I'm all in when I do something. And so I didn't want to take on athletes while I was racing because I didn't think I had the capacity for it. And Mm. now that I'm a bit removed, not fully removed, I still feel like I want to explore other areas of my life. And, and I don't know if I'm ready. I don't, I don't know. I think, um, I need a little bit of space before I want to like commit to anything. And I, I would love to take the knowledge and the things that I've learned from triathlon and the community around triathlon and give back to it in a way that's maybe not necessarily coaching. So that's kind of what I'm working on now, but um, I don't currently, I can't say like um, I'm coaching any athletes or, or actively pursuing it, which in a way, it feels like a waste, like, a, you know, multiple people I've worked with mm-hmm. within my career, fellow coaches, colleagues are like, you would be a great coach, you should do it. And I've had athletes reach out. But um, for right now, personally, I just don't think that's where I'm at. So hold on, everyone. We'll be right back after a message from our sponsors. Curad, the official medical supplier of Iron Man. Let Curad keep you strong so those strains and pains of training and you trying to find your finish line go away. With their wraps, races, and tape, and especially their far infrared kinesiology tape that'll keep you strong through all your training. Check out their products today on Amazon.com, at Walmart, and Ironman.com, and let Curad help you find your finish line. We're speaking with Lindsay Corbin from Bend, Oregon, retired before Kona this year. And Lindsay, I don't like the word retirement, (laughs) but you have to admit it's pretty doggone exciting that you really don't have to make a decision today. And you can look out in front of you and go, well, I could do that. I might do that. I might do that. And that's okay to have the 
a lack of a better word, unsuredness about what you're going to do. But it's exciting, isn't it? You can go anywhere, do anything. Yeah. No, it's super. Like I, it's kind of funny because we get multiple emails. Like people either backdoor me and email Chris, like, how's she doing? <laughs> They're afraid to ask me or like every day, like I have one or two emails in my inbox of like, no, really, like, how are you doing? And I'm actually doing like really well. I'm just, it's a breath of fresh air for me to have this freedom of, you know, set there. Chris has said like, there's a reason why people don't do pro triathlon for 17 years. Like it's so (laughs) much sacrifice and dedication and strict schedule. And um, it's just been really refreshing the last few months to have a bit of freedom and go for a run without a heart rate monitor and not have a training Mm. plan and, um, I'm just really embracing, I guess, this season of change and, and what opportunities are coming my way. And I've kind of joked that this year is this coming year, the year that we're working on is my year of yes, where I get to say yes to like so many things that for years, like I couldn't go on the family vacation or I couldn't go to my parents' anniversary or I couldn't go fishing with Chris. And um, I'm just really kind of doubling down on being able to say yes to these opportunities that for years were maybe put on the back burner for me. So, um, yeah, I, I'm doing pretty good, which is I'm bracing for impact. Like I keep waiting for the challenge or the hard part to bracing come, but I don't know. I, maybe my hard part was when I was dealing with being injured in my early retirement. <laughs> I like that. And I'm going to steal it from you. I'm telling you that right now. 2023 is the year of yes, because I have my brother and sisters call me and they go, hey, we want to go in February and uh, take a cruise and right away my hands up. OK, or go to spring training baseball games in March with my brothers. OK, yeah. you know, it is the year of yes. I, I love that. Yeah. We are but going we on a cruise. I've everybody... never been on a cruise like a cruise is so opposite yeah. of like anything I've ever been on. And Chris's family know. is like, we're going on a cruise. And the whole family now is like going on this huge family cruise. And it's like, so not Ironman triathlon, but I can't wait. And I'll be there with my Ironman hat and I'll be the one doing laps on the boat. And it's going to be perfect. <laughs> I know I've already checked out the workout room. Yeah. Is there a bike in there? Is there some, you know, some stuff in there? So Lindsay Corbin 2.0, I, I do know you always have to be challenged. I think that's your, that's your personality. That's who you are from, from a young athlete to today. You've got to be challenged. What do you think some of those challenges will be? I mean, gravel or, or ultra running. What do you think they'll be? Yeah, I'm kind of just the last few months have just been once I got healthy from my injury and stuff and got cleared to start exercising again, it just has been like, wake up and what do you feel like doing? And it's interesting to see like what I gravitate towards and what I'm curious on. And I don't have a specific goal that's like keeping me up at night. And I think until I have that huge, giant passion and fire burning inside of me, Um, I'm not going to commit to anything, but, um, in the back of, I mean, what comes naturally to me is, is running. Like I've always been a runner. That's what resonates with me. So currently I'm running every day and I'm lifting weights, doing strength training. Um, I've been challenging myself with yoga, which is like so opposite of triathlon, but it's cool. It's like a judgment free zone where there's no metrics and you can like be with people who are just kicking butt and doing like crazy headstands and backflips and they're like twice your age and I'm over there trying to steady myself on one foot. But um, (laughs) I am a bit curious to see how fast I could run a marathon. So I had thought Mm. about gravel and I've thought about ultra running and I've thought about marathoning, but the one that does keep popping up in my head the last couple months or six weeks or so has been the marathon. And Um, I am curious to see if I could reach the Olympic marathon standard, but we'll see. I'm not like fully committed to it yet, but, uh, I am, that's the one that kind of is like, I don't know. I mean, time is running out. I mean, time's not running out completely, but as far as like a window for elite athleticism and being able to test yourself and and see how fast you could go. So, um, I am a little curious on that, but I think we need to stay tuned. And I actually, yeah, I need to get the go ahead from Chris on that one too. <laughs> uh, yeah, because all of a sudden, <laughs> so, so what if you're not in the pool and on the bike? You're going to be putting a lot of miles in on the road and the track. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, had you uh, 
Have you never, Lindsay, run a marathon besides an Ironman? No, I've only run an Ironman marathon. So I, it's yeah, pretty interesting. I actually emailed um, one of the elite marathon directors to see if I could get in and, and run with the elite field in an upcoming marathon. And she was like, well, have you ever run an open marathon? What's your open marathon time? <laughs> and I said, nope. <laughs> and they obviously have time standards that you need to meet. And I haven't met the yeah. time standards. So I was like, but if we take 10 minutes off a marathon where I had to ride 112 miles beforehand and run, you know, swim an hour beforehand, I'm sure I could meet that standard, right? So we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> what, do you think the, what do you think the biggest lesson is you've learned these past 17 years that is going to take you from today to the rest of your life? I know that seems like a heavy question, but that, 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 that lesson, the lesson or lessons that can help you keep moving forward. Yeah. It's a, it's a loaded question, but it honestly, like the answer came to me pretty quickly. And that's, I mean, it's so cheesy because it's the Ironman logo, you know, slogan that anything is possible, but I just think, um, to not put a limit on yourself. I mean, I had, I, I shouldn't say I had like no business being a pro athlete, but like I was a good, I was good at sports growing up. I was on varsity, but I wasn't ever this like all-star sport phenom or anything. And I mean, I turned pro almost as a joke because I didn't want to have to do the mass swim start at Ironman Coeur d'Alene. And then next thing you know, like <laughs> dreams start coming true and, and things that you think are impossible, you know, setting the American record, going 842, you know, mm -hmm. qualifying for the Ironman World Championship 15 times, like winning eight Ironmans, traveling the world, like these dreams come true or even something as small as like, can I get out the door and do this workout on Sunday? I'm exhausted. And then next thing you know, you're running, you know, 18 miles at X, Y, Z pace. And you've, you've, you know, surpassed whatever your expectations are. So I think that in very short answer, the greatest thing I'll take from it is to like, never put a ceiling on yourself of what you're capable of. And I truly believe that with like the right mindset and a proper work ethic, that if you set your mind to something that it can you can make it happen. Lindsay, what other pros, male and female, do you uh, in the past or present respect the most and watch and go, you know, I really want to see how they do? What pros are they well, for you? Well, I mean, currently the sport is in an amazing place and I am a huge fan of the sport. Like when I'm not racing, if Ironman Live has an online broadcast with Dee Dee and Michael or Matt Lieto, I'm watching it and I'm tuned into it. Um, I would say I'm a huge fan of the sport. So I'm really excited to see. I think the sport is in an exciting place right now. And there's a ton of talent and the women are getting faster and faster. And that quickly was becoming apparent to me in this last year as I was racing that like I was the staying the same as an athlete and these people were making these leaps and bounds. So I'm really um excited to see what happens the next couple years. But um, specifically, Paula Finley, uh, she lives down the street from us. Our dogs are best friends. Um, I think she's got a great future ahead of her, and she sort of has had this resurgence in her career. So some of the younger athletes that are just getting into Ironman or, you know, Kat Matthews, she's an incredible, like, inspirational story. Um Sky, so many U.S. athletes, what Chelsea just did, amazing. So um, as far as current athletes, yeah, I'm very excited to see what happens in the next. And the, the Norwegians, those guys are crazy. I don't even know. But they're great personalities. I think they're great for the sport. So I love following them. But uh, probably one of my original mentors that um, I still respect and still reach out for for advice would be Chris Lieto. And, and Chris and I had almost the same coaches throughout our career. We worked with Lance Watson together and then we both went and worked with Matt Dixon at Purple Patch. But um, I always admired just Chris's honesty and um, his integrity and how he carried himself both on the course and off the course. And he was always willing to like share advice and, and give honest feedback. And so um, Chris is someone I respect a ton and even his son, Caden Lieto, is like getting into triathlons. So I'm excited to see little Caden start racing cool. and see how that goes. But um, yeah, I mean, too many people to list specifically. Obviously, we could be here another hour. <laughs> That's one thing I think I'll miss. I'll miss 
I mean, the camaraderie of, of being with someone like yourself at an event and just having a conversation afterwards or before the event, because I can always, I, you know, I always had that knack to be able to figure out if people were pure, if they were, if they were uh, being themselves. Yeah, yeah. And I, I enjoyed that immensely having those types of conversations with, with you all. I'll, I'll miss that. And the, and the age groupers. The, and, and, you know, the state of the sport, I love where it's at right now. You know, competition is good. You've got the PTO out there doing what they're doing, challenge and clash. And uh, how do you feel it's doing right now, the sport? Yeah, I mean, I think it's we're definitely at like a changing of the guard, both from the athletes, per, from the professional athlete perspective. Mm -hmm. I think we have these younger athletes that are coming up. And I mean, I'm not going to not mention the elephant in the room. And that's this movement of Kona, you know, going niece, Kona, niece, Kona. And I think it's exciting. Like you, you know, Chris has this quote he said to me before of like, you can't outrun evolution, like change is going to happen and you, whether you like it or not, it, it's happening and it's here. And so I think it's, it's exciting to be able to watch it from afar. And then I think it would also be exciting to be a part of it, to get to race a new world championship course on a new venue. Nice was always on my bucket list of a race I wanted to do and I never had the opportunity to. So um, I think it's going to be a really exciting race. And I think, you know, the way everything's coming together with the PTO, with athletes, you know, having to rise to a, the occasion at multiple events throughout the year. It's, um, I think we're in for a lot of excitement over the next few years. And for me, it's like, again, attitude is a choice. So you could complain about it or you could just embrace it of like, this is awesome. You know, it's, it's, it's a switch up and it's something new and it's the unknown. And I would say that most athletes want to be challenged in some way. And so this is the new challenge is like wrapping your head around what, what this um, new era will look like. Yeah. There's been a lot of changes over the last you know, 30 some years that I've been involved with the sport and every change always elicited the hard one side and the hard other side. Yeah. And those two factions took a while to come together, but in the sport, they always did. It, they always met in the middle, and that's why our sport is so great and why it kept growing. I think if people take a sit back and take a look, okay, where do you think we'll be in three years or four years or five years? Uh, and nobody can predict the future, but 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 everybody's always on one side of the bubble, and for some reason they always end up coming together. So I think that'll that'll happen here. Lindsay, what final question advice would you give to our age groupers? who are in there just starting the season, you know, they got the season maybe mapped out for 2023, maybe they don't. What advice could you give them for this time of year on what they should be doing? Yeah, I mean, I think the this time of year is a great time of year to, to nail the basics and set down a foundation. Um, I think it's easy to swim, bike, and run and, and maybe forget about the little things. But for me, Every time I sort of dialed in the details and paid attention to the one percenters of maybe going to bed half an hour earlier, or waking up and drinking water first thing and staying on my hydration throughout the day or focusing on a strength training program, um, even like setting time aside for life balance and, and spending time with your family and being more than just a, an athlete, but um Focusing on kind of all those little details that kind of make you an overall person and, and builds this foundation, that would be what I would suggest is like focus on those things now and those good habits and, and laying a foundation and putting those things on repeat so that you don't even thinking about it. It's just ingrained activity of what you do. And um, I think as the season gets busier, it's easier to neglect those things and let them go. But if you practice it day in, day out, eventually it's not even practice. It's just like, this mm -hmm. is what I do now. And it, it just becomes a part of your life and your lifestyle. So um, I would think pick, you know, probably two or three, you don't want to focus on too many things and get it overwhelming. But I think, you know, pick two or three good habits and things that you really want to dial in that aren't necessarily swim, bike and run, but maybe relate to the full picture and try to keep those habits carrying out with the momentum throughout the whole year. Is there any place in 2023 in the world you want to go and you haven't been able to go? Are you going anywhere where you've never been? Well, I, yes. Besides the cruise, where, where's the cruise going? <laughs> the cruise is going to Alaska in July. 
<laughs> oh, nice. Good for you. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm actually um, of European descent. And um, so I am working on getting my Austrian citizenship and an oh. EU passport. And so if it comes together, which is kind of a long process, um, I would like to go do some traveling in Europe that traces some of my family heritage um, and do some things and, and research on my family and where we came from. And I think I see a lot of traits and qualities in me as an athlete and as a person. And I think a lot of those things like being stubborn, being relentless, being hardworking, like that goes back to grandparents and great grandparents. So um, I think for mm -hmm. sure there's a trip to Europe in our future this summer. And then um, Chris and I have a trip planned, but we haven't exactly. We're debating in the household where we're going. He really wants to go to Norway, Sweden, that area. And I am curious about maybe doing another trip to Asia to uh, like Cambodia or Vietnam. So we're, we're up for debate where we're going to go for our crazy trip. But, um, yeah, I think there'll definitely be some that's, traveling in my future. <laughs> that's, that's a big split on a crazy trip. Oh yeah. Asia, right? I know. Norway. You're, yeah, like, yeah. you're like, <laughs> I can tell you there'll be one guarantee and in plus, that. I can tell you there'll be one guarantee in that a bike box will not be coming with us. So <laughs> see, that's right. And if you decide to pursue the marathon thing, you can, all you got to do is take your sock and your running shoes, go out for a run every morning, and then go sightsee. How easy is that? Exactly. A lot easier than doing training for an Ultraman. <laughs> I don't think I'll be signing up for Ultraman this year, I'll tell you that much. <laughs> yeah, I, probably, a, probably a good choice. Well, Lindsay Corbin, as always, it's a pleasure to be with you, to talk with you. Your career, you've inspired thousands upon thousands of people with your performances, with your attitude, uh, with your character. And so I, I, we thank you for that because the sport is a much better place because Lindsay Corbin lived in it for 17 fantastic years. So thank you very much for that. Yeah. Thank you for the kind words. It means a lot. And it is forever ingrained into my personality and my being and the, the lessons. And I will never take a day for granted of, of what a dream ride it was. So um, I'm definitely forever thankful. And yeah, I'm looking forward to being a spectator and a fan. It's going to be a lot of fun. <laughs> well, we can maybe go to race together and be spectator yeah. and fans together. You never know. <laughs> thank you, Lindsay Corbin, again. And thank you, everybody, for checking another podcast here of Find Your Finish Line. I'm Mike Riley. Thank you very much to Curat Performance, the official medical supplier of Iron Man. And always remember, you're the cause of your own experience. If you keep those experiences positive every day of your life, you will find your finish line. Take care, everyone. Aloha.